focused on hardening the perimeter hardening the edge of our networks. Uh, but as we all know, you know from Star Wars, uh, all it takes is that kind of womp rat sized hole and you've got a couple of torpedoes in your network and you know, it's game over. So I'm not saying hardening the edge is a bad thing. It definitely, it's, it's all part of a defense in depth strategy, but you, you've got to think about the edges as well, the internals of the system. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on, on today. One of the key things we want you to take away is that the UX of security matters a lot. Yeah, we as engineers, we're inherently a bit lazy. If something confuses us, we kind of sneak around it. Yeah, and I think this analogy with the door code, I've seen way too many times with security groups, with ACLs, with a bunch of other stuff. So security is super, super important. You've got to think about it throughout the stack, and we've got to make the UX good. And that's, you know, that's basically, if you're only going to take away a few things from the talk today. That's what Nick and I would really like you to take away. That security is everyone's responsibility. And that doesn't matter whether you're dev, ops, QA, architect, PM, everyone is involved in this kind of thing. A lot of us are sort of modernizing our stacks as well. If you're into obviously CNCF tech, you're looking at things like Kubernetes, like Envoy. And as we're making these networks environments more heterogeneous, it can lead to new challenges around security. And we think defense in depth is vital. You know, edge and security communication is one part of the picture. In, in an hour, we're only going to focus on this very small part. We're going to do a couple of reminders around, you know, defense in depth in general throughout your application development lifecycle. But it's really important to have multiple layers of defense. When it comes to networking, Nick and I have bounced this around quite a bit. We were at KubeCon uh, in Barcelona earlier in the year. We had some really interesting chats with folks after our talk there. And kind of riffing off the, the slogan from the London Tube, uh, London Subway, mind the gaps is really important. It's very easy to have accidental encryption gaps or accidental kind of uh, permissions and so forth within your system. So we're going to focus on making sure you're secure from end to end. And I've said it already, but it's, I'll say it again multiple times, all security must have good user experience or good developer experience, because if your whole team is not capable of using the system easily, they will skirt around it. Yeah, for better or worse, people will work around it. So um, I think I skipped a slide there. This is, uh, this is me on the right, Daniel Bright. I'm product architect at DataWire. We're behind the open source tools like Ambassador and Telepresence. We specialize a lot in sort of Kubernetes and cloud native workflow. And my colleague today will be Nick from Hashicor. I'll let you introduce yourself there, Nick. Hi, so I'm, I'm Nick Jackson. I'm a developer advocate at HashiCorp. And um, Daniel and I used to, to work together, which is how we, we kind of first met working on, on solutions very, very much similar to this. So I have had a real job as well. I'm <laughs> If I skip on, uh, but security is everyone's responsibility. And I'll hand over to Nick now. Like we, as we were putting this presentation together, there was a bunch of facts, Nick, that we saw. That we were like, whoa, weren't we? Yeah, and, it, and it's kind of interesting, I think, because you kind of know that the problem is big because it's, it's pretty widespread in the news. But when you actually look at the numbers, so like 214, oh, 214, so what? 214 records containing personal data exploited every second. That's every second. That's a, a huge, huge, huge amount. And it doesn't just stop there because you kind of look at the cost, right? So the average cost of a breach of, of personal information can be $3.8 million. Now, the kind of the thing about that is that that doesn't account for mega breaches. So a mega breach, 50 million records, $350 million it can cost a company. And, and you say, well, where do these numbers come from? Well, the numbers come from a, um, accredited sources, but look at this. So here's the evidential proof. So British Airways um, had a very unfortunate leak a couple of years ago. And under European legislation, GDPR, which um, protects the personal identities of um, European citizens, which doesn't just affect European companies, it affects any company globally which holds data on European citizens. But they were fined 1.8, sorry, 183 million pounds or $229 million by the European Union, uh, which is absolutely staggering. And that's not even accounting for their costs of themselves putting the problem right. And then look at uh, the, the Equifax. So Equifax probably affected, I think the numbers were something staggering, like 
40% of individuals living in the United States, which is just crazy. But again, like Equifax have been fined $700 million. So uh, these are not just made up numbers. These are, are sort of real numbers. And we did actually take them from very credible sources as well. So 72% increase, right? It's, it's not going away. Like the, the, I think Equifax and British Airways were back in 2017. And since then, there's been a 72% um, increase in reported, reported incidents. The, the numbers, which I really, really encourage everybody to kind of dig into and, and just have a read because they're super interesting. The Jamalto Breach Level Index, great report. You can download that free from breachlevelindex.com. And that will kind of go into some of the, the, the sort of the organizations and some of the, the different methods which are, are being sort of used to acquire this data. But um, a really interesting study which was produced by IBM. So IBM's cost of a data breach. And, and in this paper, what they've done is they've broken down sort of all of the different constituent parts, such as internal investigation, external fines, loss of business. And they've kind of broken down what it actually costs an organization. So huge, huge numbers, huge, huge bits of money. And we're going to help you solve that problem with open source, which is cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> awesome. So we mentioned at the start about app, app modernization. It's a sort of popular topic. Uh, anyone doing a digital transformation, this kind of thing, you, you probably heard of the, of the buzzword. Uh, what often it's about is embracing cloud native technologies that we all know and love, things like Kubernetes here. And you've got your users. They're obviously consuming applications and you're trying to say move things to, to Kubernetes, containerized workloads. But let's be honest, you know, as, as much as we all know and love Kubernetes, we can't do a big bang overnight from the existing tech. Uh, we jokingly like to say heritage or legacy, we're going to pick your name, but it's the money-making apps. Yeah? It's the apps that have allowed businesses to get where they are. You know, you, you've kind of built firm foundations using existing technology, racking, stacking, bare metal, this kind of stuff. But you want to embrace kind of both these things. You want to move to say or stand up new things on Kubernetes, things on cloud, but keep the existing tech working nicely as well. You probably also, if you've been around for, say, 10 or 15 years, you've probably got mainframes in the mix as well. Maybe you've got some kind of REST API on the top now, some kind of way of consuming from that, consuming that data. It, you've probably also got some, like, random, you know, computer under, like, Bob or uh, Jane's desk that does payroll. You might need to network that in. And as much as we're trying to bring all these things together, a lot of these stacks, a lot of the technologies are quite heterogeneous. And, you know, I'm talking from an infra level, from an OS level, from an app level, and putting these things all together is hard enough, let alone thinking about security. We're going to look now a little bit at defense in depth. So I mentioned up front, um, you know, defense in depth is vital. And uh, Nick and myself, we really like, recommend these three books if you're getting into security in general. Um, it can be quite a journey, being honest, it was for me, and I'm, I'm not claiming I'm an expert, but I've really learned a lot from Adam Shostak in particular there. Great books on threat modeling, great online videos, and the other two books there, Zero Trust Networks and Agile Application Security, have really helped me understand the challenges and the, and the sort of depth of security that I need to think about when I'm working with teams. I will do a shameless plug. I, I wrote a book actually last year. If you are looking in the Java stack, like myself and Abraham put the book together, had a whole chapter just on thinking about security, things like that, if you're trying to build a pipeline in the Java world. But enough shameless plugs for the moment. These are my three main books that we, we recommend. But you need to think about things like hardening and scanning infrastructure. You need to think about things like scanning your code scanning any libraries you bring in, dependencies, SDKs, and you need to think about scanning the packages, be it VMs, be it DEBs, be it um, containers, whatever you're packaging and deploying, you need to scan that now because there's typically an OS with a bunch of things the, with an attack surface that we maybe didn't have to deal with as developers in the past. We, we hand that off to ops. Now it's much more visible in the kind of threat landscape. We also have to think about things like encrypting data at rest. Um, it should be a no-brainer. Most of the cloud services these days, simple kind of flag in the console to encrypt data, and you can choose if you want to manage your keys and tip to hash it or vault for key management and so forth. There's plenty of solutions out there to help you do that kind of thing. We're mainly focused today on encrypting data in transit, so from literally end user all the way through to service, and also thinking about the principle of least privilege. So not only in terms of what people can do, both from users say and internal ops users, but also in regard to services. Can the web 
talk to the back end and the database or can the web tier only talk to the back end? Does it need to access the, the database, for example? We'll definitely focus on, on these things using a couple of open source uh, texts and, and Nick will run you through a comprehensive demo at the end to hopefully make some of the things we're talking about over the next, say, 20 minutes a bit more concrete. That's the idea. But if you're thinking about exploring end-to-end -end comms using some kind of system where you've got, say, Kubernetes and, and VMs in the mix here on the screen, um, Many of us, and Nick mentioned actually, Nick and I worked at Not on High Street in the UK together about four or five years ago now, I think it was Nick, wasn't it? And we used console at the time. We had some VMs. We were using Mesos actually back then before Kubernetes was kind of MGA. And we were using console as a service discovery mechanism, not only for say ingress. And um, so if you're making requests against um, uh, an API gateway, but you can use console to direct the requests to the relevant services, but also internally. If a micro services needing to talk to other microservices to do its work, you can use console as a kind of distributed key value store to understand from a service discovery point of view where you need to route the traffic to. Now, the reason we're talking about Ambassador and Console is they're both using Envoy, uh, Envoy Proxy, which is a CNCF technology. And um, so we'll break that down a bit more later on. But there's many other solutions in this space that do exist in plenty of other great open source things that you can go and have a look at as well. But I mainly work with Ambassador, uh, with DataWire. Nick works a lot with Console, obviously, so we're most familiar with these. But if you think about a user making a request to an API gateway, if that API gateway can link up to the service discovery mechanism, then it can forward on traffic as appropriately. So we're mapping, say, a prefix like slash, um, slash shop, and then the gateway can forward on that request to the shop front service. And that service may then need to reach out to other services, say, in a Kubernetes cluster, or it may need to reach out to something you know, that's more in the heritage stack. So it might be going across networks, maybe a flat network, maybe a bit more complicated than that, different VPCs, that kind of thing. Um, but that's fundamentally what we're going to be focusing on today. This journey from a user making a request to the actual request being fulfilled by talking with multiple services in a kind of microservice -y landscape. If we focus a little bit on the API gateway now, um, so many names in this space, Edge Proxy, Ingress, uh, I've heard things like Application Delivery Controller. They sort of encompass more or less things depending on the terminology used, but primarily it's about exposing internal services to end users, sometimes via multiple domains. So, you know, dub, 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 Google, dub, 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 Google internal or something like that, for example. The user shouldn't care or shouldn't even know what is serving the traffic on the back end. So the edge gateway, the API gateway should really hide the fact that you're running stuff on Kubernetes or VMs or bare metal or whatever. We need to know as engineers, but definitely our customers don't. From a security perspective, things like TLS termination is really important at the edge. Things like enforcing minimum TLS versions. Uh, a common attack is to try and downgrade a protocol at the edge. So, you know, you're going back to, a, say, a TLS 1.0, where there's some known issues, you can kind of try and attack from that perspective. You also want to do things like um, user authentication, authorization. Um, you can use things like, uh, say, IDPs, like uh, Keycloak, Otka, um, you know, GitHub, social logins, these kind of things. And you can often, uh, if you're using, say, things like OAuth, you can get scopes and roles, and you can add these to tokens that you can then pass down through your stack. Obviously, the applications do need to be aware of, of the tokens they're passing down, but you want to centralize your authentication at the edge. You don't want to be doing it multiple times. And ideally, you want to really have just one or, or a very small number of authentication solutions. I know many big enterprises I work with don't. They have multiple, um, multiple sort of authentication solutions, but you want to try and consolidate them for ease of management if you can. But something that often gets forgotten about, and we see quite a bit um, in, in working with DataWire folks, is that you need to do things like rate limiting because this is very easy to be attacked in ways that are not always intuitive. So doing things like denial of services or trying to fuzz APIs and trying to brute force the authentication is really quite common these days. So you definitely want to be thinking about this kind of thing at the edge as part of your entire solution. It's not just authentication and authorization, it's securing the transit from TLS and it's using things like rate limiting and timeouts and things like that. Just using Ambassador as an example, it's Kubernetes native open source um, framework. And the kind of way we configure it is using CRDs. Again, many other frameworks exist and the CRDs are often subtly different. We've used annotations in the past to configure Ambassador, but you can kind of get a flavor for how you configure your edge gateway. 
ideally you want this to be loosely coupled config. You want individual service teams being able to define a mapping for their service and exposing how end users consume it. Maybe your, um, your one team is routing via console, one team is routing via the Kubernetes API, and maybe there's different timeouts required. You want to decouple this mapping of um, sort of endpoint API web prefix to um, the actual service. You obviously want to think about probably more from an operational standpoint, centralizing some of the config though. So we have like modules in Ambassador, there's other very similar things in other tools where you define say TLS and apply this globally. So we're saying, you know, we're in this, this config, we're redirecting clear text from 8080 to make sure it's all, everything's going over TLS. And um, you might also set minimum TLS versions here, this kind of thing. A TLS is really important to set up at the edge. Even if you're using CDNs, we'll cover that in a minute, it's really important to make sure your edge uh, is secured well. Uh, this is a config I've already sort of walked through there. One thing I would say, and, I, and I've chatted to some folks at HashiConf recently about this, is friends don't let friends manually issue TLS certificates. There's fantastic uh, websites and, and tools out there these days, like Let's Encrypt, you can get um, TLS certificates from them. Hat tip for the Jetstack folks, a fellow UK company, done fantastic work with Cert Manager for integrating renewal of um, TLS certificates with Let's Encrypt via Kubernetes. We use it a whole bunch, and there's other solutions of course do exist, but massive fan of, of Cert Manager. So please don't be hand rolling your TLS certificates. It's very easy to let them expire and then you've got all bunch, you know, all manner of problems on, on that note. I did mention CDN. So Nick and I have chatted about this quite a bit. And Nick schooled me on some of this stuff with his use of, of Cloudflare. Again, many other CD, CDNs do exist. They are a very useful tool in your arsenal for the, you know, things like DDoS protection, uh, Cloudflare, Akamai, these kind of things have WAFs, have web application firewalls built in. And the whole point of a content delivery network is they can cache traffic and they can have points of presence close to where your users are. So there's many benefits of using CDNs, but do take time to learn about the security um, config in, in your CDNs. Uh, Nick's going to break down a bit more later on about, say, using origin certificates. So encrypting traffic between the CDN and ambassador, in our case, the, the edge gateway. You want to be forcing HTTPS at the edge. You can use things like HSTS just below, which is a new strict transport security protocol, which is interesting and worth checking out. You can even do kind of MTLS style authentication between CDNs and the edge gateway. And again, you can enforce minimum versions on the CDN as well as the actual uh, origin as well. These are things that are totally worth thinking about because I bumped into this paper a while ago, definitely worth a read if you're using CDNs. Some folks do sometimes treat CDNs as a kind of magic security blanket that they throw over their application thinking it's going to completely make it you know, rock solid. But as this kind of academic research shows, it's very easy to have a badly configured origin, which people can find and attack, and then they completely bypass the CDN and the WAF functionality. So this stuff is, as we keep saying, it's really important to think about the end to end and mine the gaps. Moving on a little bit more towards the kind of service meshy space now. Service mesh is very popular, very sort of buzzword. Istio has driven demand there. Fantastic work by Linkerd, fantastic work by the console team. Like this is a really active area of interest we find. And you know, the three pillars, as, as Nick's talked about before, with service mesh is observability, reliability, and security. And Nick and I, in that project we worked on uh, a few years ago now, we wanted to do TLS between services. We were doing microservices. We wanted to have really good observability, but we found it really hard with a mixed tech stack. We had Java, we had Ruby, we had Go, and you know, we were doing SDKs that were language specific. Pulling some of this stuff out into what's now called a service mesh makes it much easier to do. And really a service mesh is fundamentally about exposing internal services to internal consumers. It's not really focused on the end users per se, it's more internal traffic within your cluster, within your data center, within your network. And you can even segment the networks up as Nick will describe in a bit more detail. Kind of as I mentioned with the API gateways, a service mesh encapsulates the infrastructure within the DC, within your Kubernetes cluster, within your VMs, these kind of things. You shouldn't really know or care where you're routing to, the service mesh should do service discovery and point you in the right direction. You need to care from a mechanical sympathy point of view, understanding kind of from a tech level where you're routing to, but you ultimately want to defer a lot of this to the service mesh itself. And the service mesh can handle things then like service identity. If there's a proxy, a sidecar process sitting very close to your application, and if you can guarantee secure transport, say going over localhost between your app and this sidecar, then the sidecar can do a lot of functionality 
in terms of generating identity, upgrading protocols, doing observability, MTLS, and your application doesn't have to know about it. So it can be a Java app, it can be a Ruby app, it can be a Go app, providing you've got like a sidecar that is plugged into the rest, rest of the mesh, the sidecar takes on the responsibility of doing things like service identity. Awesome stuff like uh, access control lists. Console's got a concept called intentions with nickel demo. Really, I found this useful. You can segment the network and define what can talk to what at a service level, not an IP or a port level, at a service level. So it's much more intuitive to reason about and easier for me as a developer to understand I'm allowing web to access middle tier, middle tier to access data store, for example, rather than some arcane IPs and you know all these kind of things. You can also do things like enforce metadata. So make sure that um, what you're passing down through the stack uh, is, is, is correct. Uh, Envoy has a lot of um, capability in this space. I know console is adding more and more support for this, but um, Envoy has some real rich functionality for enforcing kind of what we're passing down through the, the microservice call chain. I mentioned Envoy, Envoy several times. Envoy is an amazing piece of kit. There are many other proxies out there. So, you know, show love to Nginx and HA Proxy, for example. Uh, why I like Envoy so much is it was built of the cloud native uh, era. Matt Klein, the whole Lyft team, and everyone supporting from Google and IBM have done fantastic work on this proxy. And to be honest, Ambassador is literally a control plane for Envoy. It's a specialized, you know, edge kind of control plane, but we provide simple instructions that compile down into Envoy config. Envoy config is easy to understand, but it's very cumbersome to manually generate. That's why we created Ambassador as an open source project. Console's now leveraging the same thing. With Console Connect, you can run Envoy sidecars on your services, and Console will manage things like the TLS uh, certificate issu issuing. So you can have identities associated with each service. And it will manage uh, a whole bunch of other things like service discovery for you. And you can collect telemetry, which Nick will break down more and more. So Envoy, massive hat tip to the whole Envoy community. They are a fantastic community. Um, and I really think that it's valuable to have throughout your stack at the edge and sort of down through the, in the services as well. A little bit of console config. I'm sure um, Nick will be breaking this down a bit more. But if you're using Kubernetes and you're setting up, say, console with Helm, which is often what I do, real nice Helm chart on uh, console-helm on, on the Haskell website, or Haskell GitHub, I should say. Um, it's kind of like a three-liner to would using a mutating webhook to inject a configured Envoy proxy as a sidecar to your app. And then you can do some cool things, which Nick will talk about with the protocols and specifying your upstreams and your metric collection. Like it's li literally, for me as an engineer, me as a developer, it's this simple to put my service mesh with my existing apps I'm deploying onto Kubernetes. We'll talk a little bit more in depth now about the network segmentation and about minding the gap. So, there's a bunch of gaps as we look through this kind of stack as in, you know, you've got to think from the end user to the CDN, from the CDN to the edge, from the edge across to the first service. So edge gateway across into the mesh and then to other services in the network and maybe other services across the network as well. And Nick's going to talk about the identity and network segmentation uh, challenges you have there. So the, the kind of the, the benefits that we get out of highly distributed architecture, I mean, we get the ability of availability, we get redundancy. We, we get a, a lot of wonderful things by using sort of modern schedulers like Kubernetes. But one of the things that kind of causes us problems is that we need to think about the way that we think about security and network security. Because many of the kind of the traditional ways that we'd go about managing this don't apply anymore. So what do I mean? So the first thing is that kind of a lot of trust used to be placed in, in the perimeter. So in external firewalls in external routing and, and things like that. But one of the, the sort of the common factors in, in pretty much all of the recent attacks, certainly all of the big ones is that the attackers actually come from within and, and it's come from within because there's been, let's say a vulnerability in an application framework, and that, that's allowed an attacker to access the, the network, bypass the perimeter, execute some remote code, um, and then move laterally throughout the network. And that lateral movement has been the thing which has done the damage, not the initial attack. So we, we need to think about this. We need to kind of think about how we isolate our networks. So how do we stop somebody from going between services? How do we stop them from moving laterally? Well, we need to use internal network isolation. And again, you know, this is not a new concept. Network segmentation has been around 
pretty much since Nat. So it's like 30, 40 year old concepts, but the, the kind of the concept behind network segmentation is that you break up your network into areas of high and low risk or into different areas of risk. And once you've got those different areas built, you strictly control the traffic, which is allowed to flow between them. So you're in effect petitioning, partitioning your network. So for example, here I've got my front end services, which are pretty much public. And then I've got my back end services. This might have my financial data, my personally identifiable data. What I want to be able to do is to strictly control the traffic that can flow into the back end, because based on our remote code execution vulnerability, that will happen in the front end segment. But we're not dealing with just virtual machines anymore. We are running multi kind of tenanted nodes. We're running multiple pods, multiple containers on the same node. So we need to start thinking about how do we do service level segmentation? And yeah, you know, you can go so far with like IP tables and IPsec and things like this, but as Daniel kind of mentioned earlier, really when you're sort of dealing with, with the kind of security, you want a good UX, you want it to be easy. It, it has to be actionable. Otherwise, the chances are you just sort of don't do it. And the service mesh really tries to, to kind of solve this problem. So those dynamic environments, let, now we kind of define what like network and service segmentation is like, why does it not necessarily apply in dynamic environments? And, and it mainly doesn't apply because it's really, really complicated because network locations are not known. You know, even within your sort of Kubernetes cluster, you've got natting going on. You don't necessarily know which node a pod is running on. You don't know like what the IP address of the pod is or what the IP address of the node is. The nodes are changing all of the time because you're running them in an auto scale group. Kubernetes is horizontally auto scaling things. Everything is changing. So the, the traditional approach where you may say, hey, I'm going to go for sort of clearly defined routing rules and firewalls, you just can't do it anymore because you, you don't know what the, the locations are. So you need to rethink that concept. And you need to say, well, network location is not the thing that I want to deal with anymore. What I want to deal with is network identity. Service identity should be the thing that I'm concerned with, not location. And again, this is kind of the premises of, of which sort of service mesh security is built. It's, it's all about network identity enforced through MTLS certificates. Yes, if I wrap up for doing the demo a bit then, Nick, as in one of the key things we've said is about being able to identify various things within the stack. So the edge gateway, proving that the edge gateway is what it is when it's speaking to services. And when services are speaking to other services, being able to say, I am the web server, I am the back end, I am whatever it is. Being able to prove, using things like X509 certificates and a trusted and CA, being able to prove for this MTLS, this mutual TLS, in addition to just encrypting the actual network, being able to prove identity between services is very powerful. Um, we, we showed you some console config earlier on and, and Nick's gonna do a bit of a live demo in a second, but if you're looking to create intentions, be able to say, in this case, we're using the command line interface, doing console intention, we're creating a deny rule that the web cannot talk to the database. So I mentioned earlier on, you have web middle tier database. It makes sense that the web can talk to middle tier and the middle tier can talk to database, but web shouldn't really be able to talk to database because the web may be in the DMZ and you may have like, you know, credentials in the database, for example. So using this kind of service level breakdown of what can talk to what, I personally found it very intuitive. Now you don't have to use the console um, a, uh, CLI or API. If you're a bit of a hipster and Nick totally introduced this to me, uh, SMI, the service mesh interface was announced at the recent KubeCon uh, in Barcelona, Microsoft, HashiCorp, a bunch of good folks involved with this new spec. And it's a way of defining kind of an abstract level over all the service meshes, concepts like intentions, concepts like access control lists. And kudos to Nick in his emoji demo, he's already created uh, an SMI example using console underneath, but defining CRDs based on SMI. So there's a traffic target CRD, which allows you to map to various routes within your, um, in your cluster, and you can specify what can access what. And it's a default deny. So you add on these traffic targets saying from a source with a uh, of ambassador, and we're identifying it using the Kubernetes service account, ambassador can talk to the destination of the Emojify website. 
again, also identified via a service account. So I've really enjoyed playing around with the SMI stuff. Nick's walked me through a bunch of this thing. It's a real nice way of defining and putting in, if you're using things like GitOps, you know, we all know and love a bit of GitOps and WeaveWorks folks. If you're using a kind of GitOps pipeline, you can define all these rules in YAML, in Kubernetes CRDs, like your rest of your workflow, like the rest of your pipeline. So it just makes it easier to do the right thing. And I'm a massive fan of making it easy to do the right thing and making it hard to do the wrong thing. So this for me was a real nice kind of find of and kudos to everyone involved in the SMI. Right, Nick, I should hand over to you now. Uh, I hope the demo gods are smiling on us. You are the man in charge of this one. I right. stop sharing. I will just share my screen. There we go. So let's have a look. So what we're going to do um, is we're, we're just going to look at how we can set up Ambassador. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy. Um, and we'll, we'll look at some of the configuration. Um, and fingers crossed, it'll all work. But um, we'll look at the full process anyway. All right, so what have I got? So I do have um, my, my sort of Kubernetes um, cluster running. And I've, I've got some stuff already installed. I do have um, a couple of applications. And I've got console deployed onto to Kubernetes there. Um, console I actually deployed with the Helm chart. So it was literally a case of Helm install, uh, which was super nice. Uh, lots of same defaults there to get you kind of up and running, but it's pretty pretty straightforward. And you can, you can find that at HashiCorp, uh, GitHub, and it's console-hem. We are working on getting that pushed into the official Helm repos, but, but for now, you can kind of grab it grab it from there. So we've got console installed. Um, we've just got a couple of apps. Again, this is just to save a little bit of time. Um, let's take a quick look at console running here. I'm not exposing console or any of my UI um, to, to the general public, because that would be a bad thing. Um, I'm just going to access it through here through um, kube, kube proxy. So this will just open up my console UI. Come on. Thank you. And there we go. So that's all up and, up and running. And we can, we can see some services in there. Um, console will also sync your Kubernetes services that you've got defined so that you can kind of do that two-way traffic stuff. But um, I've just got a bunch of stuff there. So let's begin. So the first thing that we, we need to do is we need to install Ambassador. And installing Ambassador is, is super, super easy. We have um, the configuration, and I've literally just downloaded this straight from the Get Ambassador IO website. Really easy to, to get this um, set up and installed. So everybody should check that out, please. It's like so good. Um, so we have um, the standard sort of setup. So we do need some RBAC in order for Ambassador to work, because Ambassador is going to need to kind of listen to some uh, Kube APIs in order for its CRDs to work. So we do have those CRDs in there. And then we've got um, the, the sort of the pod spec and, and things. It's, it's fairly straightforward sort of Kubernetes stuff. In order to, to work with Ambassador, and um, Ambassador works with Linkerd and Istio and um, Console, so it's, you, know, you can work with a, a bunch of different service meshes, you, you kind of leverage the, the, the various plugin. So I'm going to install as well the, the Console Connect plugin. Again, this is just stuff that I've downloaded from the, the Ambassador website. Um, there's nothing really clever going on there. It's just standard sort of Kubernetes services are back and uh, deployments. And I'm going to need a, a service um, because I want to be able to direct my SSL and my standard HTTP traffic to Ambassador. So one thing that, that kind of we also need to do is we, we need to use the, the Ambassador um, annotation here, because we need to configure Ambassador to tell it that it should be using the, the console resolver. So it's going to use console resolver for its, its service discovery. So let's, um, let's get that sort of up and running, because it's going to take a little bit of a uh, minute or so to, to configure the, the load balancer. So kubectl apply-f, 
and I can run everything there. Right. Cool. Now, what we need to do is we need to configure our edge with TLS. And so did Daniel sort of spoke about why that's really, really important. We don't want to leave any gaps. So the setup that we, we have for you is that we are using Cloudflare and we're using Cloudflare's WAF and that, that's at the very edge. So our HTTPS certificate at the edge is provided by Cloudflare and the, the Cloudflare WAF is going to be sort of protecting the, the origin. What we need to then therefore do is we need to have Cloudflare speak to our origin. And again, we need that to happen over HTTPS. We don't want any, any gaps. And what you can do with Cloudflare is that you've got the capability of um, accessing the, the sort of the, the origin certificates. So with an origin certificate, when Cloudflare makes a request to the, the, the origin, which is ambassador, it's going to validate that the certificate is correct. So it's, it's going to make it really difficult for anybody to kind of spoof that origin. And this is all available. So I've, I've already downloaded this certificate. I've got it sitting here on my computer. Um, so if I just, can I take a quick look at that? What did I call it? I have it called origin.cert. Standard TLS certificate. So, you know, nothing, nothing clever going on there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the ambassador CRDs, which is this module here. And this is what I'm going to do to configure my origin, my ambassador to use the, the Cloudflare origin. It's going to just use a Kubernetes secret. So what I need to do is I need to load my certificate of my key into a Kubernetes secret. So I can, um, I can do, I can do this, oh, there we go. Um, just using again, standard sort of Kubernetes workflow, kube create secret, and I'm going to um, give it the, the origin and the key there. That's gonna create that and add it to Kubernetes. And Cloud, uh, sorry, Ambassador is now gonna be protected with, with TLS, so. Let me just double check that that module's been applied. Yeah, that's unchanged. All right, so we're good. So let's see if our load balancer has come up. So our load balancer there, I've got this stack running in, in DigitalOcean who I, I absolutely love. I think they're a great um, setup. Um, and I do have a different IP address. So let's now configure my, my DNS there in Cloudflare. So, right. Just setting my, my domain name up. So what's next? So I've got ambassador running. I've got my edge set up. What I need to do now is I need to kind of look at some ambassador configuration because at the moment, even though everything's kind of like set up, there's, there's nothing rooting. So let's, let's take a look at that configuration. So for the, the ambassador configuration, I'm, I'm going to use again the, the CRDs. So I've got the mappings here. And this is my first mapping. So I'm just going to say anything for slash goes to my Emojify website sidecar proxy. So I'm sending any, any of my root traffic to my Envoy proxy for my Emojify website. What I'm also doing is I'm using host header matching and that, that's gonna give me the capability of using the same load balancer for multiple domains. I have my API, so I'm, I'm running the, the website as a, as a React.js website, has no backend. The backend is a separate um, JSON-based RESTful API, which is accessed directly and I've got that mapped on a path of v2 api so again it's on the emotify today domain 
Um, so I'm using the, the prefix this time, again with the host, and I'm gonna map it through to my Emojify API service. Setting up configuration elements, I'm using default stuff here, but you know, I can configure my round different load balancer types, timeout, retry policy, all of those wonderful reliability patterns I can do in there. So I, I was using that host mapping because I have two domains. So I've got grafana.emojify today, and I've just got my main website. Because I can do this with, with Ambassador, it means that I can secure both of those with, with HTTPS. I can secure the traffic right through the stack, but it also means I can use a single load balancer, which is kind of nice. So let's apply that. Oops. So I'm going to apply those, those ambassador routes. And what's going to happen is ambassador is, is going to um, reconfigure itself. And that'll happen pretty much automatically because of the, uh, the, the, the CRDs there. Uh, let me see if I can just get the ambassador dashboard up. Again, none of this is exposed. I'm using kubectl um, proxy, which is a super nice way to kind of just get into there. But here's my, my ambassador dashboard. You can see that um, I've got my, my roots. You can also see that these are not healthy, and that's because we haven't configured the security on those yet. So if I go over here and I refresh, still not gonna work. And the, the reason that it's not going to work is that I haven't configured that implicit security between the services. So I want to be explicit about, sorry, the, the, the intention that one service can talk to another. Now, you know, I could do that through the UI. That's not particularly great infrastructure as code, but I can also do it through SMI. And one of the things I love about SMI is that it gives you that kind of consistent workflow no matter which, which service mesh you're using. And um, I really do think it's a, it's a great initiative. So let's see how easy it is to configure the security. So Daniel showed you a kind of a snippet before, but this is a, an SMI specification. Again, more CRDs, um, that, that sort of great workflow that you're, you're used to and I can explicitly sort of configure the, 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 the allowed routing between sources and destinations. While I'm gonna, let me just apply that. Cool. So they're all, all being created. So while those are being applied, and that's gonna be pretty quick, what I wanna just sort of quickly show you is how do you actually service mesh enable your, your application. And you, you kind of do that really, really easily. So with, with console, we use annotations. Some other people might use CRDs, but, but in either way, it's still pretty straightforward. I don't have to define the, the, the actual Envoy sidecar. I'm just configuring these annotations to say that I want it to happen. And when I run my pod, that's automatically going to get injected. So I've only got two containers here. I've got um, my API and I've got StatsD because my API is um, using StatsD. My Envoy is using Prometheus. Metrics, all the things. Like we're we're um, we're going all in. But um, again, you know, really, really, really sort of straightforward. I I hope. And. Refreshing my intentions there, you can now see that that SMI configuration that I applied has now sort of clearly defined those permissions. So the important one down the bottom here, all services are not allowed unless there's an, a sort of a, a clearly defined override. So ambassador is allowed to talk to my Emojify API, ambassador is allowed to talk to my website and to, to my Grafana instance, my API is allowed to talk to my cache and my API is also allowed to talk to my face detect. Now, the moment of truth. And it works. So we, we've now got uh, everything up and running. Let me, let me just give that a, a quick test. 
you're on the webinar and you want to try this, this is public. So it's HTTPS and Modify dot today. And I'm probably going to regret saying that, aren't I? Because uh, it's not a great big server. But that's working. So Emojify, like soon to be a CNCF project, it's incredible. Basically allows you to replace um, faces with, with emoji. And um, if I do a, a search for Daniel Bryant, let's have a Ooh, quick. This could be embarrassing, Nick. There's a lot of wrestlers out there called Daniel Bryant, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we will, I think we'll grab, uh, grab this one here. Copy image address. All right, there we go. And I'm just going to paste that into there and hope that that is a JPEG image. And we wait. And there we go. That's, that's, <laughs> that's cool. but um, we've, we've literally just, just configured sort of um, that, that sort of end to end process. Um, I mean, we, you know, we didn't install console, but, Honestly, give it a try. Like it takes a couple of minutes. It's the amount of time it takes for the pod, the container to pull onto your kube cluster and for the health checks to start passing. The, there's my Grafana dashboard. So we've got traffic running through there. Um, all of the observability, which we get out of Ambassador and Envoy, which is, is pretty, pretty nice to see. Just a, a super simple dashboard. Um, and I think... Have I missed anything? But I think I'm pretty much done there, Daniel. Oh, it's good. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I just want to wrap a quick conclusion slide, then we'll grab some questions if we've got any. I can steal the screen share back. And this is literally just really um, referencing what we said at the start. So hopefully that's given you a an idea of um, the kind of end-to-end -end sort of flow and, uh, with of the both the high level and the actual um, code itself. All the code that Nick demoed is available on the interwebs, uh, Mojify uh, app. I've got the links in the next slide actually, so you can download the code, um, run through the whole thing yourself. I, I've done that a few times and I found it really useful just for understanding like the, all the components involved and how to like, Nick says how to put your workflow, how to adapt your workflow. Um, with things like SMI and so forth, it's really, you don't have to adapt your workflow. If you're using Kubernetes, you're using YAML, it's pretty much the same process. But I, I find that's a really nice, the Emojify app is a really nice way to play with all this stuff uh, together. But in conclusion, I mentioned at the beginning, and Nick and I really think this is, is true. You know, we, we worked in a variety of roles, some together and obviously many apart, but security is everyone's responsibility. Really can't uh, underestimate that. This, this is really, really important. As you're bringing in more stuff to your stack, um, yeah, by all means, you know, Kubernetes, VMs, bare metal and these things. But bear in mind that the heterogeneous nature of this means it's, a, as Armand says from HashiCore, it's a multi-cloud, multi-platform, multi-service world. And we have to respect that from a, you know, operational standpoint, but definitely from a security standpoint too. We have to make it easy to do the right thing. Dep defense in depth is really important. We've only really focused on uh, edge and inter service comms today. Clearly, there's a whole bunch of other things involved in security, which we're not trying to make smaller. They are super, super important. We've only got an hour, so we've only focused on so many things. But we think this is uh, really important, this security all the way through. And it's now much easier than it was, say, a year, two or three ago because of things like service mesh, because of things like SMI are making it much easier for us as engineers to configure this stuff. Do be careful at minding the gaps though. It's all too easy to misconfigure an origin or not have TLS on the first hop from gateway to service mesh. I've seen a bunch of things over the, over the sort of last few months. Um, we really need to pause, think about your threat model, think about your whole flow end to end and mind the gaps. And we've said it before, but make it easy to do the right thing. All security must have a good user experience. Otherwise engineers are gonna work around these things. And the only thing worse than having no security is having security that no one uses because you think you're secure and you're actually not. So this, is, this stuff is really important. Uh, this final slide, bunch of references. So we've done some stuff on, on InfoQ. We've talked on the blogs and we can find us on the um, Kubernetes blog as well. And hat tip to Todd Rydell and the team at HashCore. They put together an Instruct, a kind of online tutorial where you can play around with Ambassador, play around with console. I think SMI might be there. If it's not, we can soon add that, I'm just thinking. But a hat tip to Todd and the team. Fantastic um, way to sort of have a playground to safely try this stuff out without actually having to install anything on your local machine. Uh, on that note, oh, code examples, of course, Emojify app, courtesy of Nick there. Uh, I think we're ready to take any questions, Nick, Sheila, on that one. So thanks for everyone's attention. Wonderful.
Thank you, Daniel and Nick, for a great presentation. We do have some time for some questions. I think we have about six minutes. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please drop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many as we have time for. Um, and I think there are two right now, um, Nick and Daniel, if you want to take a look. Yeah, that, that kind of um, very, very similar. Um, I can probably answer both of those in the same, with the same answer. Um, so we, predominantly when we, when we, we, we sort of built console, console is a cloud native product. It predates modern schedulers like Kubernetes, but it was definitely designed for the, the sort of the cloud native world. Now, when we, we sort of introduced service mesh features, we had to consider that, that a lot of folk were still using console with, with virtual machines that were running it in EC2 instances in AWS, in GCP, and in Azure, and that they needed the ability to extend the service mesh beyond their, their sort of greenfield Kubernetes cluster, but to actually encompass the entire of their, their sort of estate. So console was designed to be incredibly performant to handle the the large lo workloads that we were sort of um, had existing and from a, a service discovery perspective consoles always had service discovery baked in um, we had to use the ability of having this kind of neutral service discovery so that the pods would be able to talk to virtual machines virtual machines would be able to talk to pods kubernetes clusters which are completely not federated, would be able to communicate together. Um, so it was designed predominantly for, for the performance, for large environments. I do want to caveat that and say that you don't need to be running 20,000 nodes to be able to use console and ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, it scales regardless of what you're using. I've got like four pretty generous nodes in DigitalOcean there. Um, there are folks using it with hundreds of nodes and, and as I say, scaling it up to the tens of thousands. So it, it, it really scales right across. I saw someone asking about sharing the, uh, the, um, links again, we'll share the deck afterwards, everyone, but I'll just put it on screen now. If people do want to make a quick note on the, uh, on in particular, the Mojavi code. Thank you. And do we have any other questions? Um, going once, going twice. Yeah. I don't see any more listed. You can always find Nick um, and I on Twitter. So we can always ask us on, on there. You can find us at a lot of the KubeCons, hopefully KubeCon NA coming up or at other conferences too. So please do come and approach us. We, are, we, are, we like to answer questions in the, in the real world as much as the Q&A. So. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Great. Well, thank you, Daniel and Nick, for a wonderful presentation again. Um, and that is all the questions we have time for today. Thank you all for joining us. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today. We're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye.